<clears throat> well, good afternoon, everyone, and I just like to introduce myself. My name is Susan Thompson and in my capacity as an Associate Director of the City Futures Research Centre, I'm delighted to welcome everyone to this afternoon's seminar. I first would like to pay my respects to the traditional owners of our ancient continent. And today I'm speaking to you near the border of the Gadigal and Wongal tribal lands owned by the people of the Eora Nation. And this stunning mural that you can see on the screen marks the boundary of those tribal lands and is testament to the traditional owner's stewardship of place, the places and spaces that all people in Australia now enjoy. And this particular mural is just down the road from where I'm sitting and it is at the beginning of one of my favourite walks in the inner west of Sydney and again showing testament representing stewardship of place, the most beautiful place that has been there for thousands and thousands of years and that I can still enjoy to this day. Now I'll now introduce our guest speaker, Dr Ed Wensing. I've known Ed for many years and uh, this is both in my capacity as a teacher in the planning program at the University of New South Wales and as a researcher and valued colleague. Ed's contributed to planning education here at UNSW in many significant ways over the years as well as contributed to publications for which I've been responsible and I've been fortunate to make contributions to those of Ed's. And over the years, I've learnt much from his wisdom on Indigenous issues and planning. And I'm very grateful for that. So thank you, Ed. Ed is widely respected and acknowledged as one of the most knowledgeable planners on Indigenous land use rights and treaty negotiations. Ed is an urban planner and I'm proud to be introducing Ed also myself as an urban planner and his amazing background crosses a range of disciplines as well as encompassing government and private sector positions, not to mention academic and educator roles as well. Ed recently completed his PhD through the National Centre for Indigenous Studies at the ANU. And his research topic was land justice for Indigenous Australians. An amazing achievement and congratulations, Ed. I know you've, you've, you've had your PhD in your back pocket for a little while now, but it really is phenomenal. Ed is currently an honorary research fellow at the Centre for Aboriginal Economic Policy Research. He's also a sectional sessional lecturer in the School of the Built Environment here at UNSW. And if that's not enough, he's also an associate and special advisor at SGS Economics and Planning. And you can read more about Ed's impressive career in the bio notes for the presentation this afternoon. I'm now going to hand over to Ed, or in just a moment, um, who will be presenting his, his talk. And I'll just remind you, please, to make sure that you have your microphone turned off during Ed's presentation. And if you have a burning question, pop that in the chat. We will have questions and answers at the end of Ed's presentation. So Ed is going to talk to us today on the topic of Indigenous people's human rights and treaty developments in Australia, why land and land use should be front and centre in any treaty negotiations. So thank you, Ed, and welcome to the City Futures Research Centre seminar series. Over to you. Thanks, Susan. Thank you very much for your kind words. I appreciate that. I'm just going to share my screen so I can show my um, slideshow. Is that on full screen? Yes. Thank you. Let me begin by acknowledging the country where I live, work and play. I wish to acknowledge the traditional owners, of the Ngunnawal and the Gambri people, where Canberra, the nation's capital, is located. I pay my respects to your elders past and present, 
I also pay my respects to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who may be in the audience today. I acknowledge that the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples of Australia are among the world's oldest continuing cultures and maintain one of the world's oldest continuing forms of land tenure and land use planning and management. I acknowledge your continuing governance systems, your diverse languages, customs and traditions, and rich knowledge of ecological systems. I recognise and am grateful for the enduring connection and stewardship of country that is integral to your identity and culture, as it has been for thousands of generations. I also acknowledge that you have suffered the indignity of having your land taken from you without your consent, without a treaty and without compensation, and that these matters are yet to be justly resolved. It is my sincere hope that my research contributes to a just resolution. I have long said that it is a privilege to engage with the First Peoples of Australia and to work in that intercultural contact zone between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's rights and interests, however defined by them, and the Crown's interests in land and land use planning and management. I wish to also warn Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that I will be using the names of deceased Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. In this seminar, I want to take you on a journey through many documents that I've been examining over the last few years, which I believe are increasingly pointing toward the fact that land use and land and land use must be at the centre of any treaty discussions or negotiations in Australia. I'm sure I'm not alone in that view. I will be drawing on a two part um, journal article that I am currently authoring for the Commonwealth Journal of Local Governance. The first part was published in June and the second part will be published in December. I want to begin by sharing um, an exhibit from the Encounters exhibition at the National Museum of Australia in 2015. I was struck by this inscription <clears throat> at the exhibition, which reads as follows. They talk about the civilised world coming to the untamed world, but I think it's the other way around. It was the barbarians that came to our civilised world. Those words were inscribed by Mr Goldsmith, a Karnamiyana man from Adelaide, and I'm indebted to the National Museum of Australia for recovering these, issues, these images and allowing me to share them. I think Mr Goldsmith's words sum up the current situation pretty well. Since the National Indigenous Constitutional Convention and the release of the Uluru Statement from the Heart in 2017, we have seen some very significant developments toward a treaty or treaties at the sub-national level in Australia. In fact, world comparable developments, which are sadly lacking at the national level. I'll return to these matters shortly. As a land use planner, it was always clear to me that land and land use matters must be at the forefront of any treaty developments around Australia. I'm keen to share my research and insights into why this has become crystal clear. As the Uluru Statement from the Heart says, how could it be otherwise? The Australian context. In Australia, the consent of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples was neither sought nor given when the British Crown took possession of the land from 1788 onwards. In the legal theory of the formative years of the penal colony, Australia was terra nullius, no one's land, and the Aboriginal peoples were regarded as savaged or uncivilised. And until Marbar No. 2, the generally accepted legal position was that at the moment when the British Crown imposed its sovereignty over Australia, all land became the property of the Crown. The consent of the Aboriginal peoples was neither sought nor given. There were no treaties signed between the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and the Crown, in contrast to the experience in other British colonies such as Canada, New Zealand and parts of the United States of America. Of course, as we now know, the notion of terra nullius was a convenient myth. In Marban No. 2, the High Court of Australia found that the common law of Australia was capable of recognising the communal, group or individual rights of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in relation to their pre-existing and continuing connection with land or waters according to their traditional laws and customs. While Marban No. 2 went some way towards rectifying the misrepresentations of the past in rejecting the idea that Australia was terra nullius in 1788, the fact that the method of acquisition was invented, somewhat retrospectively, makes the legal justifications for white settlement very precarious and serves to highlight the injustices of dispossession and the continuing denial of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's ongoing ancestral land rights and interests. As I have long contended, 
There are two elements to the High Court's decision in my note number two, the substance and the essence. The substance of the decision was about Eddie Mabo's and his fellow claimants' rightful claims to their ancestral land and waters under their law and custom. The essence of the decision, however, was about the recognition of another system of law and custom, ostensibly about land, but also more generally. Many eminent lawyers and scholars disagree with me on this second point, but the many First Nations peoples that I have spoken to over the years continue to echo this element. The Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples of Australia have for several decades, and perhaps always, been openly stating the need to sit down and negotiate issues of sovereignty, self-determination and land rights through a treaty or treaties in a civil and peaceful way. Calls for a treaty in Australia are not new. There are at least 11 declarations that the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples of Australia have been making over the past 80 years, from 1937 to the present, all of which include demands for the recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's prior ownership, continued occupation and sovereignty, and affirming their human rights and freedoms, including over ancestral lands and waters. They include the, the, the petition to King George um, in 1937, which Prime Minister Joseph Lyons, by the way, never passed on to the King. That's the one in the top left-hand corner. And they extend through to the all-new leaders' declaration of sovereignty presented to Prince Charles when he visited uh, the Yolngu people in Arnhem Land in 2018, which is on this slide. I've actually written to Prince Charles and I'm awaiting a response to find out whether he did actually pass this on to the Queen and hence to the Prime Minister. I'll return to these declarations but later, but the one that stands out the most of course is the Uluru Statement from the Heart. Why? Because unlike all others, it was presented to the people of Australia. Why was it presented to the people of Australia? because the delegates of the convention realised that giving the Uluru Statement to our political leaders would just be a waste of time and effort. Our political leaders have a long track record of never taking any action on them. Hence, I talked about Joseph Lyons not passing it on to the King. The Uluru Statement was issued to the people because it is the people of Australia that vote to change the constitution. So the delegates realised they needed to have a dialogue with the people of Australia. Hence the final paragraph of the Uluru Statement reads, in 1967, we were counted. In 2017, we seek to be heard. We leave base camp and start our trek across this vast country. We invite you to walk with us in a movement of the Australian people for a better future. Now let me turn to the international human rights context. The Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples of Australia are increasingly demanding that the full suite of international human rights norms and standards apply to their affairs and to dealings with them. Of course, the key document is the, is the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, as we term it, UNDRIP. UNDRIP may not be a direct source of law, but it nevertheless carries considerable normative weight and legitimacy for several reasons. It was adopted by the UN General Assembly. It was compiled in consultation with and with the support of Indigenous peoples worldwide. And it reflects an important level of consensus at the global level about the content of Indigenous peoples' rights. It also reflects the needs and aspirations of Indigenous peoples, as well as the concerns of states. Furthermore, UNDRIP expresses rights, and by doing so, explains how Indigenous peoples want nation states and others to conduct themselves in relation to matters that may affect their rights and interests. There is an expectation, therefore, by Indigenous peoples and others that UNDRIP imposes obligations on states and third parties to conform to the standards expressed in the Declaration, and that as a consequence of endorsing UNDRIP, nation states can no longer make decisions affecting Indigenous peoples' rights and interests by imposition, but rather have a duty to consult with Indigenous peoples on the basis of free, prior and informed consent. Not only does UNDRIP set out Indigenous peoples' human rights in 46 articles, it is also, as Rodolfo Stavenhagen says, a map of action for guaranteeing, respecting and protecting Indigenous peoples' rights. And as Grace Nosek observes, UNDRIP enshrines the principle of free, prior and informed consent as a critically important human right which is inextricably linked to the fundamental right of self-determination. And as Erica Irene Dias asserts, 
that it would be inadmissible and discriminatory to argue that Indigenous peoples lack the right to self-determination merely because of their indigeneity, and that nation states therefore have a duty to accommodate the aspirations of Indigenous peoples through constitutional reforms designed to expand the concept of democracy. Correspondingly, Indigenous peoples have a duty to try to reach an agreement in good faith on sharing power with the existing state and to the extent possible to exercise their right to self-determination by such means. Hence the need for treaties. Now, Rodolfo Stavenhagen was the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms of the Indigenous Peoples from 2001 to 2007, and Erica Irene Dias was the Chairperson of the Working Group on Indigenous Populations and Special Rapporteur on the, of the UN Subcommission on Human Rights from 1984 to 2001 and both were fairly instrumental in the formation of UNDRIP. And in fact, I reckon Irene Dias makes the point that um, no other UN instrument has been elaborated with such an active participation of all parties concerned. Mind you, that's not what the four countries said when they didn't, when they voted against it in 2007, um, Canada, Australia, New Zealand and the United States, telling lies in the face of the truth. Um, just to say, uh, in, in Article 1, I did also make some observations about how, to how the, the UN um, has observed Australia's performance in relation to um, implementing uh, UNDRIP uh, and Indigenous rights more generally. And in Article 1, I make the observation that the Universal Periodic Review actually was quite critical of Australia. And in fact, this slide on the right here sums up um, their latest assessment of Australia's performance um, generally on human rights, but also on Indigenous peoples. And in fact, in um, their um, periodic review earlier this year, they made the point that they are expecting Australia to take the necessary steps to develop a national plan of action to implement UNDRIP. And UNSERD, the UN Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination in 2017, made a similar recommendation, particularly about the right to self-determination and treaty making. Of course, we're waiting to see whether Australia responds to those requests from the UN. Let me turn now to the Australian context. In the course of conducting the dialogues around the country, the Referendum Council developed a set of guidelines or guiding principles as a framework for assessing and deliberating on reform proposals. The National Convention did not reopen the work that had been undertaken by the dialogues but concentrated on bringing the outcomes from the dialogues together in order to arrive at a consensus. Three things are worth noting about these guiding principles. Firstly, the inviolability of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander sovereignty is the first of the 10 guiding principles, and you can read it there on the screen. The centering of sovereignty at the beginning of the Uluru Statement reflects the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's concerns and grievances with the Crown. And the statement says, this sovereignty is a spiritual notion, the ancestral tie between the land or mother nature and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who were born there from remain attached there too and must one day return thither to be united with our ancestors. This link is the basis of the ownership of the soil or better of sovereignty. It has never been ceded or extinguished and coexists with the sovereignty of the crown. It is an indisputable fact that the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples were the first sovereign nation of the Australian continent and its adjacent islands and possessed it under their laws and customs. Secondly, principle five is about the importance of truth telling as a guiding principle for healing the relationship between First Nations and Australia as a whole. The need for truth telling emerged from several of the dialogues because the true history of colonisation must be told. The genocides, the massacres, the wars, and the ongoing injustices and discrimination. The importance of truth-telling is also enshrined in several of the preambular paragraphs to UNDRIP, as well as in Articles 5, 15, 37 and 40. Truth-telling is also enshrined in the UN General Assembly Resolution on the basic principles and guidelines on the right to a, rem a remedy and reparation for victims of gross violations and international human rights law and serious violations of international humanitarian law. In the resolution of the right to the truth by the UN Human Rights Council in 2012, and the resolution on the right to the, to the truth passed by the UN General Assembly in 2013. Thirdly, 
Principle eight is about agreement making through treaty. The need for a mechanism for First Nations agreement making also emerged from the dialogues as a priority. The right to treaties, agreements and other constructive arrangements with nation states is enshrined in Article 37 of UNDRIP. As I concluded in part one of my article for the Commonwealth Journal of Local Governance, the Uluru Statement represents a major turning point, precisely because it not only sets out the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders' outstanding grievances, it also invites the Australian people to engage with them through treaty and truth-telling, both of which are embedded in international human rights norms and standards. While the Australian government's response has at best been disappointing, developments relating to treaty and truth-telling are emerging at the sub-national level in Australia and are gaining momentum, and these are worth exploring. Let me first look at treaty developments in Australia. Five of the eight sub-national jurisdictions in Australia have committed to treaty or treaties. In order of commencement, they are Victoria, the Northern Territory, Queensland, the ACT and Tasmania. Let me deal firstly with Victoria. The Aboriginal community of Victoria and the Victorian government have been working toward a treaty since 2016. To their credit, the Victorian government's first response to calls for a treaty following an open community forum with the Aboriginal communities in Victoria in 2016 was to acknowledge that there was a statewide representative body with whom the government could negotiate on it. There was not a statewide representative body with whom the government could negotiate on an equal basis. The Victorian government therefore established a treaty advancement commission to oversight the establishment of the First Peoples Assembly of Victoria and other elements of the treaty pathway. The Victorian government has adopted a three phase process as follows. And what this slide shows on the screen is the number of documents that have been generated in the process of, um, of, of treaty making um, developments in Victoria. The Victorian government has adopted a three phase process Phase one, establishing an Aboriginal representative body, which met for the first time in December 2019. Secondly, developing a treaty framework. And thirdly, negotiating the treaties. While the Victorian process has not been without some issues, in particular concerning representation, there is much to be learned from their experience. Specifically, the Victorian government's commitment to transparency and openness about the process from the very outset. The annual public record reporting requirements of the various institutions ensuring transparency. And thirdly, the considerable lengths the Victorian government has gone to to engage with the traditional owner voices across Victoria on two projects. Firstly, the, the traditional owner self-determination scheme, and secondly, the Victorian traditional owner engagement project to discuss different but complementary questions about traditional owner aspirations, challenges, and relationships with government. The most important feature of the approach adopted by Victoria is that the state of Victoria and the Aboriginal peoples of Victoria will have equal status as negotiating parties to a treaty or treaties. This has never been done before in Australia and is truly groundbreaking. What is also interesting in Victoria is that the role that the Federation of Victorian Traditional Owner Corporations is playing. So far, it has produced five out of six discussion papers and they're all excellent papers. Understanding the landscape, the foundations and scope of the Victorian Treaty, sovereignty in the Victorian context, UNDRIP and enshrining Aboriginal rights, Aboriginal control of Aboriginal affairs, and Aboriginal parliament and public service. And the fifth one, a framework for traditional owner treaties, lessons from the Traditional Owner Settlement Act. All of these papers make a very valuable contribution to the discussion and depth of consideration in that context of a treaty or treaties, not only for Victoria, but also for other jurisdictions as well. Paper number five is very pertinent because it discusses how the native title system has worked out in Victoria following the High Court of Australia's negative determination in the Yorta Yorta case in 2002 and the subsequent development of the Traditional Owner Settlement Act. Paper number five examines the 10 year history of the Settlement Act and argues that the Act has not delivered on much of its early promise. I agree with this conclusion and therefore, of course, land matters will come to the top of the agenda in the treaty discussions in Victoria. Let me now turn to the Northern Territory. In 2018, the Territory's four Aboriginal land councils wrote to the Chief Minister of the NT proposing to reach a memorandum of understanding about a consultation process for a treaty between the Aboriginal peoples and the, of the NT and the NT government. 
At a meeting in Alice Springs in 2018, it was agreed to establish a treaty working group to develop the MOU. The purpose of the MOU was to build on the significance of the 30th anniversary of the original Barunga Statement by providing a way of facilitating consultation with all Aboriginal people in the NT to allow for a framework to be agreed for negotiating a treaty or treaties. The land councils were concerned that there were a wide range of Aboriginal interests in the Territory and that all Aboriginal people in the Territory must have the opportunity to engage in the process and that the non-Aboriginal community also needs to be involved and committed to the process. In June 2018, the four Aboriginal land councils and the NT government signed an MOU, which has become known as the Barunga Agreement, paving the way for consultations to begin with Aboriginal people of the NT about a treaty, and also to be led by an independent treaty commissioner. The Barunga Agreement states that the key objective in any treaty in the NT must be to achieve real change and substantive long-term benefits for Aboriginal people and that it needs to address structural barriers to the well-being of Aboriginal people in the NT and provide for economic, social and cultural benefits. The Treaty Commissioner's discussion paper sets out a treaty framework based on learnings from British Columbia, Aotearoa New Zealand and of course Victoria. What is particularly pertinent is that the treaty development process rests on the NT government's express acceptance of the following three foundational propositions. That Aboriginal people as the First Nations people were the prior owners and occupiers of the land, seas and waters that are now called the Northern Territory of Australia. The First Nations of the NT were self-governing in accordance with their traditional law and custom. And thirdly, that First Nations peoples of the NT never ceded um, sovereignty of their land, seas and waters. As these matters are already agreed, the Treaty Commissioner maintains they provide a great starting point for treaty discussions. Hence, again, of course, land will be at the top of the agenda in treaty discussions in the Northern Territory. The Treaty Commissioner's discussion paper contains a great deal of useful information, citing not only the relevance of UNDRIP, but also the Van Boven Bassini principles on the right to a remedy and reparation for victims of gross violations of international human rights law and serious violations of international humanitarian law. These were adopted by the UN General Assembly in 2005 and have previously been relied upon in Australia by the Human Rights Commission in the context of its inquiry into the stolen generations. The Uhuri's recommendations were deliberately structured on the Van der Leven principles to achieve reparation through a series of interlocking measures far wider than just simply monetary compensation. The Treaty Commissioner's discussion paper outlines a treaty negotiating model, which comprises three elements parties, including creating a formal governing body of First Nations, a negotiating process applying the six um, the principles of the six stage process that the British Columbia um, province in Canada relied upon, and the federal government. The Commonwealth has complete control over the NT, therefore the Commonwealth must be involved or acquiescence to a treaty or treaties to avoid any last minute override. I think what many people don't understand is that while the Commonwealth has conferred a degree, a large measure of self-government on the NT, and in fact the ACT as well, under Section 122 of the Australian Constitution, the Commonwealth can make laws on any subject for the territories, thereby overriding any territory laws and rendering them ineffectual. In a legal opinion to the NT Treaty Commissioner, Brett, Water, Brett Walker SC, advises that the support or acquiescence of the Commonwealth Executive and the Parliament would be useful reassurance throughout and after the process of negotiating a treaty or treaties. He hastens to add, not necessarily as a party, but rather to keep it appropriately informed of the negotiations between the Territory and the First Nations. Let me quickly skirt round the other jurisdictions. Queensland, the ACT and Tasmania have also made commitments to enter into treaty discussions. However, only Queensland has so far progressed to the stage of establishing a treaty advancement committee to develop options and provide independent advice on the process. It is expected to report by the end of 2021. South Australia under Labor government commenced treaty negotiations with three regional organisations across the state, but these processes were abruptly halted following a change in government in a state election in 2018. Although Western Australia has not made any commitments toward a treaty or treaties, 
they do have the Nuna Native Title Settlement as the full and final resolution of all Native Title claims in Southwest WA in exchange for a comprehensive settlement package. The settlement involves approximately 30,000 Nuna people, covers approximately 200,000 square kilometres of land and waters, and is valued at $1.3 billion. The package includes agreement on rights, obligations and opportunities relating to land, resources, governance, finance and cultural heritage. The WA Minister for Aboriginal Affairs at the time, Ben Wyatt, likened it to a treaty, um, 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 as close as Australia has ever come to a treaty process between a group of traditional owners and a government. Well, it fails to be a treaty, principally because the parties were not negotiating on equal terms. New South Wales has instigated, instigated what's called the OCA program, Opportunity, Choice, Healing, Responsibility and Empowerment, to support Aboriginal self-determination and priorities through an ongoing commitment to transfer control of program design and delivery to Aboriginal communities. While many aspects of this initiative are laudable, the New South Wales government remains conspicuously silent on treaty and truth-telling. Let me talk now about truth-telling developments in Australia. Again, feedback from the dialogues at the National Constitutional Convention and from the community engagements for developing a new agreement on closing the gap found that genuine reconciliation cannot be achieved without confronting and acknowledging the legacy of the past through some form of truth-telling. The Uluru Statement called for the establishment of a Makarata Commission to supervise a process of agreement making between governments and First Nations and truth telling about our history. Again, Victoria and the Northern Territory stand out. In February 2021, the Northern Territory Treaty Commissioner released an excellent paper about truth telling. This paper discusses the concept of truth telling, the role of a truth telling commission, the experience of truth telling commissions around the world and experiences in Australia, and truth-telling models and what a model for the MT might look like. The Australian experiences include, for example, the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody, the Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Sex Abuse, and the Bringing Them Home National Inquiry into the Stolen Generations. Other countries examined include Canada, South Africa, Guatemala, Mauritius, Peru, and Timor-Leste. While there are diverse opinions about their successes or failure, it does not mean they are ineffective or that they cannot or that we cannot learn from those experiences. Truth telling processes in other countries have played an important role in reconciliation by uncovering and acknowledging past human rights violations and ongoing injustices towards First Peoples. And it's worth looking at how they were undertaken to provide some insights into the potential challenges and opportunities to better inform the processes in the NT. The NT Treaty Commissioner concludes that while each Truth Commission is unique because each place has its unique history, there are many common historical themes, such as the impacts of colonisation, the forcible removal of children and the intergenerational trauma. Let me now turn to Victoria. <clears throat> in Victoria in June 2020, one of the first motions the First People's Assembly passed was a resolution for the State Government of Victoria to establish a truth and justice process. The Victorian government responded positively, and in March 2021, they announced the establishment of the Uruk Commission, named for the Wemba Wemba Wamba Wamba word for truth, as the first formal truth telling process into historical and ongoing injustices experienced by the First Peoples of Victoria since colonisation. The Uruk Commission has been established as a royal commission with the full powers under the Inquiries Act of 2014. The Commission will establish an official record of the impact of colonisation, develop a shared understanding among all Victorians of the impact of colonisation, as well as the diversity, strength and resilience of First Peoples cultures, and make recommendations for healing, system reform and practical changes to laws, policies and education, as well as matters to be included in future treaties. With the establishment of the Europe Commission, Victoria is now the first and only jurisdiction in Australia to have begun the process of implementing all three key elements of the Uluru Statement, voice, treaty and truth. Other jurisdictions. Well, the commitments to truth telling by other jurisdictions are a little harder to find, but interestingly, they're all laid out in the implementation plans that all the jurisdictions have recently um, completed for, imp for implementing the Closing the Gap agenda. Sadly, the Commonwealth's only commitment to truth telling is in relation to its stolen generations reparation scheme in the NT and the ACT, 
because the Commonwealth still has jurisdictional responsibility for these past wrongs, not the Territory governments. The Commonwealth claims that these sit alongside the additional measures the Commonwealth is taking to progress truth-telling as part of the nation's journey to reconciliation. Well, an exhaustive search of the Australian government's websites doesn't reveal anything else about truth-telling by the Commonwealth. The ACT government states that it has allocated funding of $20 million over 10 years for the establishment of a healing and reconciliation fund. However, no further information is publicly available about the purpose of that fund or whether a truth-telling process will be established as part of it. The Queensland government notes that the consultations for the path to treaty in Queensland identified truth-telling and healing as a crucial foundation for a treaty or treaties, but no further information is provided as to how this may occur. The South Australian government simply states that it supports truth-telling as part of the state government's organisations um, identifying their history with Aboriginal peoples. The WA government, something very similar, and again, avoiding the truth. So apart from Victoria and the Northern Territory, the commitments to truth-telling by other jurisdictions are still very weak, or have little or no relevance to addressing, addressing past injustices relating to land. Let me talk a little bit about land reforms. <clears throat> again, the Closing the Gap um, implementation plans reveal some startling information. Target 15 and 15A of the 17 socioeconomic targets in Closing the Gap relate to land. And in 15A in particular states that by 2030, a 15% increase in Australia's land mass subject to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's legal rights and interests. Well, the baseline data on the Closing the Gap website shows that Indigenous rights and interests have already been recognised over approximately half of the Australian land mass and a further 20% is subject to native title claims and claims under statutory land rights schemes, such as the 40 outstanding claims in the NT and almost 40,000 in New South Wales. Um, the Commonwealth's commitments are mainly around continuing to fund the existing arrangements, but my understanding is that those funding levels are far too insufficient to meet real demand, particularly in supporting the work of the prescribed bodies corporates set up after native title determinations. Elsewhere, well, Australia, the ACT, South Australia, Tasmania make no specific commitments to increasing the quantum of land subject to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's legal rights or interests. Queensland makes no specific commitments either, but noting that the Torres Strait is already, um, so the whole of the Torres Strait is actually already subject to native title determinations. The Northern Territory, as a territory government, makes no further commitments because it's not really within their purview, it's the Commonwealth's. New South Wales has calculated that to reach that target um, of increasing the quantum by 15% would require an additional 6,130 square kilometres of land through the Aboriginal Land Rights Act or through the native title system, through consent determinations or through Indigenous land use agreements or through joint management arrangements in the national parks. But their, their implementation plan <clears throat> does not make clear how that might happen. Victoria has made a rather ambitious claim that all of Victoria will be covered by Aboriginal legal rights and interests by 2030. Currently, about 21% of Victorian land as sea is covered by native title determinations and or traditional owner settlement agreements. The Victorian government, through its broader, broader commitment to a treaty or treaties and its Victorian Aboriginal Affairs framework is committed to concluding all native title claims and or entering into agreements under the Traditional Owner Settlement Act by 2030. Western Australia commits to a partnership arrangement and hoping to resolve land through native title determinations. But we're waiting to see what might happen with the Aboriginal and Trust Estate, for example, and to what might happen to recognition outside the Noonar um, agreement areas. These commitments by the jurisdictions don't give me a great deal of confidence that Target 15A will be met by 2030. Let me quickly make some other, um, these are the Closing the Gap um, implementation plans, by the way, across the country. And that's target 15 in the uh, national agreement. But let me quickly make some observations about the, um, the land, the statutory land rights schemes around the country. In New South Wales, well, the land rights scheme has been in place for about 40 years. It's scandalous that there are about 39,000 outstanding claims which at the current rate of clearance will take about 90 years to clear. It's also scandalous that New South Wales has the highest number of non-claimant applications under the native title system, 
whereby Aboriginal land councils have to resolve the, the native title matters before they can move to sell any of their land under the Land Rights Act. Um, and these matters are continuing to cause significant tensions on the ground. Victoria has never had a statutory land rights scheme like that of New South Wales or the Northern Territory. And as the Federation of Victorian Traditional Owner Corporations rightly observes, the Tosler scheme that was devised following the devastating decision in the Yorta Yorta case has failed to deliver the expected benefits. So hence, no doubt, the treaty discussions around land will be interesting. Queensland's statutory land rights scheme applies mainly in the form of missions and reserves and only have limited application elsewhere in the state. The state of Queensland has amended its planning act to acknowledge Aboriginal people's knowledge, culture and tradition in the, in the planning system, but even that, and to the application of that provision has been very limited. South Australia has three different statutory land rights schemes currently in operation, and while the Aboriginal Land Trust model was updated about a decade ago, some further significant reforms are long overdue. Tasmania has also never had a statutory land rights scheme, but has, a, has had a one-off um, spot grant transfer arrangement. And while they're continuing to have that commitment, and that's commendable, time has moved on. So let's hope their commitment to a treaty process will address those issues. Um, the ACT um, land rights and native title remain unfinished business in the ACT. And the ACT government's subliminal one tribe policy is a significant impediment to advancing treaty negotiations. I've made some suggestions for overcoming these impediments, but I'm not sure that anyone is listening. The ACT is also currently reviewing its planning system and it remains to be seen whether they will make any progress on implementing the kind of changes that Queensland made to their planning act in 2016. I want to talk quickly about um, coexistence. There's, there are three epigraphs at the beginning of chapter one of my thesis. Um, <clears throat> and it reads, that there are two laws, our covenant and white man's covenant, and we want these two to be recognised. We are saying we do not want one on top and one underneath. We are saying we want them to be equal. And those words were uttered by David Moljale, an elder from the, the Green New people in Western Australia. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples have long accepted the need for coexistence between their system of land ownership, use and tenure, and that devised by the Australian government. Indeed, coexistence is now deeply embedded in Aboriginal people's perceptions of how the two systems should interact with each other. As I've said earlier, I've looked at these declarations, which I showed you earlier, and I've also looked at um, uh, several key documents in recent times and drawn from that the following key messages. That land is central to Aboriginal people's culture and way of life, and these are inseparable. Aboriginal people's right to pursue, reject or negotiate development on their land should be respected, especially with respect to local decision making. Aboriginal peoples want to be able to use their land as collateral for long-term social, economic and cultural development. There should be no extinguishment of their rights and interests or any diminution of the Indigenous estate and that international human rights standards are applicable, in particular the rights to self-determination and to free prior and informed consent. Um, and then I developed a set of, um, well that slide is in the wrong place, then I developed a set of foundational principles um, for coexistence. Drawing on the declarations and the points listed above, I developed 10 foundational principles. Each of the principles expresses important values that are essential characteristics of how indigenous forms of land ownership, use and tenure can be regarded as being at least equal to their Western counterparts, if not superior. All of the principles are interrelated and must be applied equally for the two systems to operate effectively side by side. In concluding, I believe the Uluru Statement will lead on, principally because um, it not only sets out the grievances that require Australia's attention, it also includes three key mechanisms for addressing those grievances, voice, treaty, truth. There are many different ways of addressing the long-standing lack of recognition of First Peoples prior ownership and occupation of the lands that comprise Australia. History also shows that such measures cannot be imposed, they must be negotiated. The challenge is for any negotiations over land rights to be based on parity between the parties with mutual respect and justice, rather than exploitation and domination by one or other party. There is so much at stake for all involved. If any of these processes fail, it will be some decades before it will be possible to revisit them. 
what is absolutely vital is that all parties come to the negotiating table with an open mind. Past prejudices and predilections must be left behind. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Ed. And um, I would like to open the floor for questions. I don't think we have any questions in the chat. Uh, there's a hand up. This hand is up. Um, Alvi, you've got your hand up. Great. Yeah, I just wasn't sure if there was a cue. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ed. That was an amazing presentation. It was very, very insightful. Um, I have a, it's a bit of a specific question. Um, I was wondering if uh, in your research you found that, um, so the, the infamous Northern Territory intervention has um, affected the way the Northern Territory approaches treaty um, or if it's influenced um, legislation and things like that. So it's, it's a bit of a, a narrow <laughs> question, but I just wondered if, it's, if you've noticed that it's influenced it at all. Um, short answer, no. Um, no, the intervention was staged by the Commonwealth, not by the Territory Government, of course, and uh, that's particularly why. But of course, the Territory Government's also changed since then. There's been a few elections. That was over a decade ago. That's not to say, of course, that the after effects of the intervention aren't continuing to be felt. I might hasten to add that the Aboriginal communities um, in the COVID situation took matters into their own hands well ahead of the rest of the country because they didn't want to be faced with another intervention like the previous intervention. Um, but whether that ultimately influences the negotiations, um, I don't know, it's a bit early to tell. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Sally. Um, if, I don't think there are, uh, um, Bala, are there any hands up? That I can't see or comments. If if not, um, there I'm is not... a question on the chat. Oh, great! Thank you. Sorry. Um, is that... I'm, I'm happy to put it if you'd like. Or I didn't. That'd be lovely, to... Louise. <laughs> sure. Great. So yeah, thanks, Ed, for just a, a wonderfully in, insightful and incredibly informative and solid presentation. As, as somebody in Victoria, I, I'm very aware of, of the discussions that are happening and you were you know, very detailed in, in sort of teasing out what might be the basis on which Indigenous statements or claims might be had in that process. I'm actually curious about two things in Victoria, and I guess it could apply to other jurisdictions. Who is actually doing the treaty negotiations from the non-Indigenous side? Like, who is it? Is the Attorney General or is it the Premier or is it a special group? And who the heck are these people? And secondly, what are we claiming, uh, as in we non-Indigenous Australians? Um, again, you, you've put up those principles of self-determination and sovereignty and land and so on. Mm. Yeah, great, get that. But it's a treaty. So I'm actually, is is what have you got any thoughts as to what the other side, the non-Indigenous side, will be negotiating about or will they be just responding to what's thrown at them? Because it is meant to be a, an equal negotiation, as you say. Very good question, Louise. Um, yes, it should be a two-way process. At this point, um, all the Victorian government has said is that the Victorian government will be at one side of the table and the First Peoples Assembly will be on the other side of the table. Um, exactly what transpires between the parties I don't think has yet been mapped out in terms of who will be the representatives of each at the negotiating table. I would imagine that like any negotiation process, on a sovereign to sovereign basis, that it would be the bureaucrats and the political advisors before it gets to the political level. So therefore one would imagine that ultimately the treaty would be signed by the by the leaders of the First Peoples Assembly and by the Premier and the Attorney General on the government side, with the Victorian government representing the whole of the population of Victoria and not just not just the non-Indigenous people, I might add, but the whole of the population of Victoria.
As to what the um, the non-Indigenous side will put on the table, I don't know. I think by implication I'm saying that the non-Indigenous side has to accept the grievances. It has to acknowledge that this country was settled the wrong way, that, that we never did acknowledge these people have a system of law and custom, that they never ceded their sovereignty. So there's a sense of mea culpa about what the non-Indigenous people have to put on the table. Um, I'm suggesting, and I did in my thesis, um, take that a step further and looked at a, a system of parity between two, between two systems of law and custom. And you can inject into that anything you like, whether it's criminal justice or family law or, or as I did in the case of my thesis, land law. Um, and, and in the middle there, you have to, there has to be that dialogic space where there's always room for discussion and negotiation between the parties. The, the, the principal thing in relation to land that I would like to see on the table is that we finally accept that Indigenous people do have the right to say no. Take a look at Duke and Gorge. I didn't talk about Duke and Gorge, but the destruction of Duke and Gorge must ring some really serious alarm bells about the total inadequacy of the synchronicity between our law and culture. Uh, I, um, um, Nobody would disagree, I'm sure, but I mean, we also know that the fairly feeble attempts to revise the cultural heritage framework in which that was all decided is sort of in WA has come to naught at this stage. Yeah, well, um, and and I think and I think um, there's room for another paper, in fact, from the from VTOC, which would be about the heritage aspects, the cultural heritage aspects, um, because I think that's been overlooked. Um, you could do another one on just about any of the statutes across Victoria, actually. I would argue that similarly the planning legislation needs to be overhauled as well, as it, as it was in part in Queensland in 2016. We're now finding, of course, that the, the way that's been interpreted by the Queensland government has got a very narrow interpretation of it, which is contrary to the law itself. You know, the, the Section 52D of the Planning Act requires that, that an entity performing a function under the Act must take into account Aboriginal people's knowledge, culture and tradition. Not about native title, not about heritage, not about land rights, about knowledge, culture and tradition. And when that happened, I went to the Queensland government and I said to them, this actually opens up a series of questions. Who holds that knowledge? How do you access that knowledge? How do you apply that knowledge? How do you know you've applied it fairly? How do you protect it from abuse? And how do you evaluate whether you've done a good job or not? And you can't do any of those things without having a relationship with the people that hold that knowledge. Um, but instead, the guidance documents that the Victorian government put out was strictly around native title and heritage. I was very disappointed when that happened. But so I, I have I have um, I have great expectations on the non-Indigenous side of the table to put a lot more compromises on the table about how we will recognise that system of law and custom particularly mm -hmm. in relation to land. And I think there's an endless list of opportunities, frankly, um, but, it's, but it depends on our willingness to go that far, of course. Yeah, indeed. Thank you very much. Mm. Thank, thank you, Ed, and thanks for that question, Louise. There's another hand up, um, I think. No? Hand, oh, yes. Yeah, Graham. Graham, hi. Yes. Hi, hi Susan. Um, Hi Ed, again. Yeah. Uh, I'm just um, encouraged by uh, Louise's questions and comments and your response to them uh, to ask you about the situation that you and I are currently trying to deal with in a very practical way in the Central Darling Shire area of New South Wales, mm. um, where where you've you know conducted some some uh, some detailed research. Um, there we we've got uh, a native title determination uh, granted across probably something like what 80 percent of the area that, that we're looking at something like that another one pending um we've got an opportunity in looking at the future of local governance in that area i think to take some positive steps forward on a on a smaller scale um in relation to a number of the issues you've talked about today and i'm wondering if you'd like to just reflect on that for a couple of minutes. Mm, indeed. Thanks, Graham. <laughs> um, yes, I think there's an opportunity to, to, to open the door. Um, the, the, the problem in New South Wales is that you've got 
you've got an inherent conflict between the statutory land rights scheme and the native title system, which which the state has refused to address or forces the addressing of that right down to the grassroots level. Um, I have long argued that in fact, in some cases, particularly where there are positive determinations of native title, that in fact, you could literally toss the land rights provisions aside um, and the title deed should be transferred to the prescribed body corporate and the prescribed body corporate should then work out the internal governance arrangements. But that doesn't answer your question about the revision of local government and local governance in that very vast area of central darling. Um, I think there are, there's a number of, um, of impetuses in New South Wales through the OCA scheme, in particular the local decision making component of that, to devolve the decision making down. Um, and when one looks at central Darlingshire, while the broader population is declining, the Aboriginal population is increasing, and in particular concentrating in Wilcannia. So I think there's a real opportunity to, to, to blend the, the native title component with the land rights component and with the general community to come up with a community government council, for example, that takes on a broader land responsibility and service provision responsibility, but also blend that with the human service components that the government is trying, the New South Wales government is seeking to devolve through their LDM process. Um, whether the community is capable of taking that on or not is probably another question. But, but nevertheless, I think the opportunities are there and I think the options ought to be explored more openly. Look, I, I think given, in, uh, given the interests of time, we might draw things to a conclusion, although I just see um, Bill has his hand up. So, Bill, have you got a, a nice quick question to round things off? Yeah, hi, uh, thanks. Thanks very much for that. Uh, that very, I mean, you sort of a forensic review of the, of the background to the native title issue, which uh, uh, draws on your many years of experience in, in the whole area. Look, uh, just, a, just a final comment really, and perhaps it doesn't require any, any, any real um, answer. Uh, it just occurs to me that so long as Australia derives so much of its wealth and has done from land, whether it be agricultural exploitation, whether it now, of course, it's a mineral exploitation or within the cities, um, value uplift uh, exploitation. Until so long as that prevails, it's going to be very difficult to get a satisfactory solution, I think, perhaps to the to the la native title issue, there's simply so much vested interest in mm. keeping control over that huge asset that mm. pushing these agendas is always going to hit somebody somewhere in the bowels of the state and they'll say, whoop, hang on a minute, don't yep. really want to go that far. Well, is that just a, a naive and irrelevant comment or is there, is there some substance to it? No, there's some considerable substance to that bill. There are now um, nearly 1,500 Indigenous land use agreements registered under the native title system across Australia. N David Ritter, a, 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 a barrister who used to work for Yamaji um, Aboriginal Land Council, um, Aboriginal Native Title Red Body, Western Australia, did a piece of work called the Native Title Market in the early 2000s. And no one's done any further research since. The problem I have with, the, well, a problem, the, the, the details that are put on the register of is held by the Native Title Registrar are simply the details of the nature of the agreement and the parties to the agreement. The actual details are hidden, they're kept secret, which is good in, in some respects. But on the other hand, we don't know, well, we do know that there's quite a different um, outcomes in a number of different places, particularly with respect to the resources sector. So depending on who's doing the negotiating on behalf of the Aboriginal party and who's in the know of what can be what can be achieved and what can't be achieved, we see some Aboriginal groups gaining considerable benefits from these agreements and royalty payments over many, many years. And those royalty payments are then paid into a trust arrangement or whatever. Um, and some of the Aboriginal negotiating parties have been willing to share that among themselves, but other Aboriginal parties who don't have benefits, uh, have, don't have access to those kind of resources, are coming out with very different outcomes. Mm. And of course, given the nature of land bill, as you know, some land is valuable, some land is not. And the same in the New South Wales land rights system. 
most of the land is residue land, not of any real value mm. to, to the modern economy. And therefore, the Aboriginal people get lumbered with bits of land that are very expensive to maintain and very difficult to attract any kind of economic use from. Mm. Um, that's the same in the native title space. Some of the determinations are over land that has incredible resource value. Some of the determinations don't. It really depends on the ability of the parties to, to know what they've got and have the access to negotiate those things. There's a desperate need to do some really detailed research on those agreements and to share some more of the experiences and the information and the knowledge that sits behind those agreements and the kind of things that have been negotiated. The, the problem I have with these arrangements is that, that you know, native title will only ever be, whilst the percentages look good in terms of the extent of land under indigenous control and management, the extent of that ownership control and management is very limited, even through joint management arrangements, for example, and even under native title determinations. You know, you take the Barkindji claim that covers the central Darling Shire, for example, and stretches over a very significant portion of, of Western New South Wales, the, the actual percentage of land out of that native title claim that the Barkindji PBC has under a direct control is extremely limited. It's less than two or three percent. And yet the whole area covers the whole part of west, far western New South Wales from the southern border to the north and over to about, you know, to the, to the east of Kamar. But the actual extent to which they're then consulted or negotiated over other land use decisions in, within the claim area that are not actually subject to native title because it's been extinguished is offensive in my view. You know, mm. uh, to me, the, 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 the scope for recognition of native title rights, even where it's been extinguished, because Aboriginal people don't relate to the term extinguishment, they ought to be written into the Planning Act as they were in Queensland. I had great hopes for what we inserted into the Queensland Act, but of course the bureaucrats got into it and gave it a very narrow interpretation. Um, retrospectively, maybe we should have gone further when we could have, when Sharon Harwood and I were talking about trying to fix it. But, but unfortunately, um, you know, time will tell that we made a few mistakes there. But yes, there's scope for, there's scope for recognition in land use decision making that doesn't necessarily impinge to owner. In fact, the, the one thing that we can do is to rewrite the definition of owner in every jurisdiction to include native title holders. Let's start with that. The only jurisdiction that does it is Victoria. No one else does it. And Victoria does it only under the Traditional Owner Settlement Act, which then again only applies to Crown land with their agreements under the Traditional Owner Settlement Act. But in fact, if you look at what procedural rights a property owner enjoys under planning statutes around the country, it's enormous. And traditional owners should be given the same status as an owner as anybody else. And that would open up the opportunity for them to be consulted on decisions that affect their rights and interests. I might Thank draw you. a line there. Clearly, so much more to talk about, so much more to discuss on these very complex issues, which um, we thank you, Ed, for really giving us so, so many insights. But before I just formally thank Ed, I would just like to thank Bala in particular for organising the seminar series and to thank all of you for coming along this afternoon. And finally, thank you to you, Ed, for giving us an in-depth understanding of treaty developments across Australia in the context of human rights and principles of treaty development. And I think it was great that you referred throughout your talk to the Uluru Statement from the Heart, given to the people of Australia, which I think is a really important and timely reminder, as is the three principal concerns through voice, treaty and truth. And I think, you know, there's a lot of responsibility on all of us to be promoting our support for the Uluru Statement and um, asking our politicians to come to account on this issue. So thank you very, very much and um, really great to have you as part of this the series and our ongoing series. We look forward to hear, seeing others of you participate in the series as well. So thank you all for a great session.
and um, I'll just say good evening to everyone and thanks very much. Excellent. Thanks very much. Pleasure to be part. Thank you. Thanks, Ed. Bye. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.